Hey there, are folks able to hear me okay? Wonderful, thank you very much. Okay, so um, no real new announcements uh, based on uh, relative to prior classes. So the upcoming things that are going on is that today I will be going over most of the redox reaction and electrochemistry material. Um, we will not be getting to uh, the example versions of uh, of various kinds of electrochemical cells today. So that will be at the beginning of tomorrow's and Thursday's classes. Those That beginning portion will be duplicates. That won't take up all of Wednesday and Thursday. And <coughs> the rest of those days will be for Q&A and muddiest points sorts of things. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the uh, things that are due this week on Thursday at five, the uh, final uh, small group activity is due. Um, the, uh, the quiz will open up at five for it, and that will be due Friday at five. And the last two homeworks, numbers 13 and 14, will be due on Friday at, uh, as well at five. Uh, on Thursday, uh, I anticipate being able to release the fourth and final midterm exam. That will not be due until the end of finals week, fr uh, the Friday of finals week at five. On Monday, the, uh, the beginning of finals week, uh, the three portions of the final exam will be released. Uh, each one is, uh, you will have an hour to do. You do not have to take them at the same time. Uh, uh, and you will have until uh, Friday of finals week to turn those three in. So you can schedule when you want to do each of the components whenever you like to, would like to. Um, I intend to have extended office hours on, uh, on Friday and Saturday of this week and, uh, I, and quite a bit of next week, though I don't know all of the details of when for, for next week. Uh, certainly Thursday and Friday of next week will be, I will have extensive ones. Uh, Monday and Tuesday, I will have some, uh, maybe uh, extensive. Wednesday, I will have some as well, although I have to, uh, uh, a part of it I will not be able to do on Wednesday of next week because I uh, have to take someone to get a wisdom tooth taken out and uh, I have to be available for transportation for that. Um, let's see, uh, do we have any logistical questions before we start getting into the content for today? Okay, so uh, I will share screen and we can get started on, uh, whoops, and we will get started on the uh, content for today, redox reactions and uh, redox reactions and uh, uh, electrochemistry. So I have the chat window up. So if anyone has questions as we are going along, please feel free to speak up and we will start going and I will try to elucidate those, uh, uh, try to address those questions as they go. So um, for redox reactions, what we're going to do is first make an analogy to a proton transfer. So uh, a Bronsted-Lowry type of acid-base reaction. So if you watch what's happening up here at the top, uh, you, can, you will see that a proton transfer ha has a, uh, the bond with the hydrogen breaking and a new bond uh, with the hydrogen forming over on the other side. So we have two components here. We have the acid, which is the proton donor. We have the base, which is the proton acceptor. Now, for, uh, for a redox reaction, we have something similar going on. It is a transfer, but it's the transfer of electrons. And so uh, what we view is happening here, we're bringing a lithium in and a fluorine in. An electron transfers from one to the other. And then in this particular case, uh, the lithium uh, ion and the fluoride ion are now oppositely charged and are attracted to each other. So they then pull together again. 
What is happening is that we are seeing a change in the electronic uh, environment of the lithium and the fluoride. And uh, that change in electronic environment due to an electron transfer is what is happening in a redox reaction. So we're going to look at two different types of electron transfer that's going on. The type that we just talked about, and we're gonna look at a different example here with magnesium and oxygen, uh, which is a full electron transfer that results in changing the charges on, uh, on isolated species. So the magnesium gives two of its electrons to the oxygen, creating a magnesium two plus and an oxygen two minus uh, a pair of ions. But we also have another type of electron transfer. If we look at the hydrogen and the chlorine down here at the bottom, the hydrogen uh, is a neutral species and it shares the electrons equally because both hydrogen atoms are identical to each other. So they pull on the electrons with, that are in the bond with equal force. So uh, we have a uniform distribution of electrons around the hydrogens here. Same thing can be said for the chlorines. Each chlorine has uh, six electrons that are not participating in the bonding in the valence shell. And there are two electrons in the bond, but they are being pulled on equally by each of the chlorines. So each of the chlorines is effectively neutral in this case. Now, when the reaction happens to form hydrogen chloride, watch what happens here. We keep the same number of electrons around each atom, but now the electrons that are part of the bond are no longer being pulled on equally. They are being pulled on more by the chlorine, which is a more electronegative element than hydrogen is. And so we are seeing a case where we started with the hydrogens being neutral and the chlorines being neutral because they were bonded to something that was pulling equally on the electrons. But in, at the end, the, bonds, uh, the electrons in the bond are being pulled on more by the chlorines than the hydrogens. And so we would expect the chlorines to be slightly negative and we would expect the hydrogens to be slightly positive. This is a shift in the electron density that's happening at this point. And so we would like to be able to describe this in the same terminology that we're using up here. And so th this is also considered to be a redox reaction. Okay, so when you have a redox reaction, you have something that is losing electrons or losing electron density in the case of the covalent bonding case. And you have something that is gaining electrons or gaining electron density as in the uh, covalent case. The process of losing electrons we call oxidation. The process of gaining electrons we call reduction. Now, oxidation, uh, is confusing to some people because it sounds like it is talking about oxygen. And in fact, historically, the first oxidation reactions that were identified were indeed having to do with oxygen. But what, uh, but the terminology has evolved since then to refer to more than just situations where oxygen is involved. By oxidation, what we mean is that we are losing electrons. Now, the, the reason historically it was called oxidation is that oxygen is very good at pulling electrons away from things. And so the first examples of oxidation did involve oxygen. But now oxidation means something more general than that that does not necessarily have anything to do with oxygen. The process of gaining the electrons, as I said, is called reduction. And a way to remember that is that the the charge is being reduced, as in getting more negative. When we have oxidation and reduction happening simultaneously, which honestly is always, you do not have cases where, uh, where just oxidation is happening or just reduction is happening, because you don't tend to have isolated electrons that you're dealing with. Uh, you have an oxidation reduction reaction, which we abbreviate to redox. Now, a way to remember these two processes is with the, um, the acronym LEO goes GER. Uh, and so LEO stands for loses electrons oxidation. GER stands for gains electrons reduction. That's a way to remember which is which of these two processes. Okay, so 
a little bit more terminology here. The magnesium we determined is the thing being oxidized. The oxygen we determined is the thing that is being reduced. But another way to look at it is what is causing the magnesium to be oxidized? Well, the oxygen is causing it to be oxidized. What is causing the magnesium, uh, excuse me, what is causing the oxygen to be reduced? The magnesium is causing the oxygen to be reduced. So we call the oxygen the oxidizing agent because it is oxidizing the magnesium. We call the magnesium the reducing agent because it is reducing the oxygen. And these can be abbreviated as the reductant and the oxidant. So the thing that is oxidized is the reducing agent. The thing that is reduced is the oxidizing agent. Or putting that another way, the oxidizing agent is the thing that is reduced. The reducing agent is the thing that is oxidized. Okay. Now, we identify what is being oxidized and what is being reduced by tracking oxidation numbers and uh, also known as oxidation states. Now, there are two, uh, let's, I know we've introduced already one way to calculate oxidation numbers using uh, the Lewis structures in a met method that is analogous to the formal charge calculations. Uh, there is another method we're going to use that is a rule-based method to determine oxidation numbers and states, and you need to be fluent in both of those. But before we even get to either of those, let's talk about some of the general principles about how we feel oxidation numbers or states should be assigned. So taking some examples, neon. Neon doesn't bond and it has no charge. So we would hope that the oxidation number of neon would be zero. Gold. So gold atoms tend to exist in blocks of gold where you have a bunch of these atoms attached to each other, but the entire block of gold is neutral. And because it all consists of the same atoms, we would expect the electrons to be distributed uh, very uniformly throughout that block of gold. And so we would expect that the oxidation number or the oxidation state for gold atoms in that situation should also be zero because uh, we should have neutral atoms of gold uniformly distributed throughout the metal. Now let's look at a monatomic ion. Magnesium two plus has a plus two charge on the atom. And so uh, we would expect that the oxidation number should be plus two. Cl2, this is analogous to the gold case, but it's just that it's a covalent molecule in this case. And so we have two chlorine atoms pulling on the electrons equally. So the electrons should be uniformly distributed around them. There's no net charge. So each chlorine atom should have an oxidation number of zero. A Cl minus ion, analogous to the magnesium two plus ion, is a single atom with a minus one charge. So we would expect the oxidation number to be a negative one. Now we need to move past single atoms or uniform distributions. So in this case we looked at a minute ago, when we have the bonds formed between hydrogen and chlorine, we want to describe the chlorine as being more uh, negative than the hydrogen. And, uh, but we also want uh, to have easy ways to calculate. So we'd like to calculate it in terms of whole numbers of electrons. So we would like to uh, list the chlorine as a minus one and the hydrogen as a plus one. Now, we can, uh, we've gone over this before. If we look at assigning the electrons for formal charges, then we split the electrons that are in a bond equally so that one gets assigned to the hydrogen, one gets assigned to the chlorine. And so what you do is you take the core charge of each of the atoms, subtract one for each electron that is assigned to that atom. And, uh, and in this case, we find that hydrogen starts at a plus one, minus one for the single electron we're assigning to it. And so we have a formal charge of zero. The chlorine, because it is in group seven, has a core charge of seven. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have a formal charge of zero. Now, oxidation numbers do the same thing, except we make a different assumption about what we do with the electrons that are in the bond. We say that the electrons in the bond go to the more electronegative element. And so the hydrogen starts at a core charge of plus one. There are no electrons assigned to it now, so it has an oxidation number of plus one. The chlorine starts at a minus, excuse me, at a plus seven. 
6543210 negative 1 counting one electron for each side of this uh, this bond and so the chlorine has an oxidation number of negative 1 so this is the lewis structure method uh, for the uh, uh, for uh, determining oxidation numbers. There's a question in the chat. Why is the formal charge of chlorine zero? Okay, I'm going to back up. So chlorine, because it's in group seven, has a core charge of plus seven. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons we have assigned to it at each one at a negative one. So seven minus seven gives us zero. Okay. All right. So here are a couple of examples. What you should, uh, I'm going to give you uh, a minute, uh, maybe a minute and a half, to go through and calculate the formal charges for this molecule and calculate the oxidation numbers for, uh, for, for, for each atom in this molecule. So, starting a timer. Hope all of you have some paper because um, there are going to be several cases today where I'm going to give you some examples to work through things. Give you about 30 more seconds. Okay, so for the formal charges, uh, I hope you determine that each one of them is a zero. So just to pick an example of this, we have the oxygen here that has one, two, three, four, five, six electrons that we've assigned to it for formal charges. And it started with a core charge of six, so it goes to zero. Oxidation numbers, but when we're, where we're assigning the electrons to the more electronegative element, oxygen's more electronegative than carbon, oxygen's more electronegative than hydrogen, carbon's more electronegative than hydrogen. So we end up with a minus three for this carbon, a plus three for this carbon, minus twos for the oxygens, and plus ones for each hydrogen. Okay, so these are just, both of these formal charges and oxidation numbers are simply accounting systems for the electrons. They are trying to determine how charge is distributed throughout a molecule. Uh, where is reality, since these obviously give you very different answers? Well, it's kind of an average of the two, somewhere in between. But, it's, but calculations are much easier for dealing with integers, so that's why we, we do this. So formal charges are used in order to uh, determine which Lewis structures are the most important Lewis structures uh, that are possible for a given compound. Oxidation numbers tell you more about reactivity. And notice in particular here that this carbon and this carbon have very different oxidation numbers. We have one that's extremely negative, one that's extremely positive. And what this will do is tell us something about uh, where reactions are going to happen. So if we brought into this compound something that is, uh, something that is uh, uh, negatively charged, we would expect it to be attracted to this carbon right here. And that is in fact exactly what we uh, would see. So if this comes in here, we can see that it, it will react here with this particular carbon. And you'll learn about this kind of reaction when you get to organic chemistry. Uh, this is a carbonyl substitution reaction. And uh, what we end up with is a, uh, a, uh, a reaction because of the difference in the oxidation numbers that we have. So 
Formal charges are used to determine the best Lewis structure. Oxidation numbers determine which atoms are holding the electrons more tightly, and then which atoms are gonna grab electrons from which other atoms as reactions are happening. We're gonna look at some examples of that later. Okay, a second method for determining oxidation numbers, which you also need to be familiar with, is uh, sort of a rule-based method. So, uh, the, the idea here is that this rule-based method tends to be faster than the Lewis structure method. And it also is usable in cases where it's not necessarily all that obvious how to draw the Lewis structure. <clears throat> and, it's, and when you're dealing with ionic compounds and a lot of uh, compounds uh, that are involved in redox reactions are ionic compounds. So uh, this method, is uh, in some cases definitely preferred to the Lewis structure method. But they end up giving you the same results when you can do both of them. So looking through these rules, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you as well, you're going to need this chart for some of the things that we're doing later. So I recommend taking a screenshot of it and uh, pasting it into something so that you can refer to it in future, thing, uh, in future screens that we're going to be coming to. So uh, if you're on a PC, you press the print screen button on your computer, and then you can paste it into something like Microsoft Word or something, and it'll show up as a graphic. Um, if you're using a Mac, um, I think it's something like Shift Command 4 or Shift Command and five, and then you can do the same thing with it. Anybody that's a Mac user, if you type that into the chat, that would be very useful. Command shift four, says Riley and Emily, yes. Okay, wonderful. So um, get yourself a screenshot of this because we will be, uh, you'll be needing to refer back to this as we go. So let's go through some of the rules. Um, for an atom in its elemental form, we want an oxidation number of zero. And hopefully that's, it's pretty obvious why we do that. For monatomic ion, the ionic charge uh, of it. If we have a molecule or a formula unit um, that has a charge, even if that charge is zero, then the sum of the oxidation numbers for everything that is part of that unit, the molecule or the uh, polyatomic ion, is going to add up to the total charge on that ion. Um, then for specific atoms or, or periodic table groups. So uh, column one, the, uh, the, alkali, uh, the alkali metals plus ones, which makes sense because their uh, ionic charges are usually plus ones. Uh, group two, plus two, same reason. The, uh, it tends to give up two electrons. Hydrogen uh, tends to have a plus one uh, oxidation number when it's combined with nonmetals and a minus one when it's in combination with metals and boron. Now, why? Well, this is because hydrogen is less electronegative than nonmetals, and it's more electronegative than metals and boron. So if it's forming a covalent bond with one of those things, then in, with nonmetals, it loses its electron. With metals and boron, it gains uh, that electron. So, uh, uh, so that explains these oxidation numbers. Uh, rule four here, fluorine. Uh, fluorine is the most electronegative element on the periodic table. So when it forms a compound with something other than itself, it has a minus one charge straight across. Because it's most electronegative, that is what happens. Oxygen. Oxygen is the second most electronegative element on the periodic table, and it tends to form two bonds, so it tends to gain two electrons. So it tends to have a negative two charge except when it's combined with fluorine because fluorine grabs the electron, and except when it's in a peroxide. A peroxide is a molecule where two oxygens are bonded to each other. So hydrogen peroxide has hydrogen, oxygen, oxygen, hydrogen, and so we would have a minus one in that case. For group 7A, which are the, um, uh, the halogens, uh, tend to be negative one. Uh, except when it's bonded to oxygen, because oxygen is more electronegative than all of the halogens except for fluorine. And then if it's bonded to a different halogen, the higher up it is on the periodic table, the more electronegative it is. So the high, higher up one will be, more, uh, will be negative one, and the lower ones will be whatever's left to, make the, uh, to give the overall charge on the, uh, on the ion. And these rules here are generally or often enough to find the oxidation number for everything that you run into. So I hope all of you have this uh, screenshotted and let's take a look at some examples. 
So let's look, for example, at this first one. We're, what we're going to do is go down in this order. And so if you want to work ahead, you can do that. Zinc chloride. Well, uh, looking at the rules, the whole compound or the whole formula unit that you're dealing with is neutral. Uh, there are no specific rules for zinc, but there is a specific rule for chlorine because it's a halogen. That rule says uh, that it is a negative one. There are two of them, so the zinc has to be a positive two. So uh, Shane asked, what text is that from? So that table is from a textbook that I taught from back in, in Oklahoma. Um, so uh, I think the name of the author of the textbook is Silberberg, um, but you can find similar uh, lists of rules in most textbooks. Okay, so this specific example, uh, we have the chlorine. Each chlorine has a negative one oxidation number and each zinc has a plus two oxida uh, oxidation number. Now it's important when you're assigning the oxidation number and you're writing them above uh, the elements in a particular compound, don't put the total for all of the chlorines. You don't put a negative two here because there are two chlorines. You put up here uh, the charge on each of them because what matters is looking at each atom and does the oxidation oxidation number of each atom individually change or not. So, uh, so that's the convention when you're writing the oxidation numbers. Okay, let's look down now at the SO3. So we don't have a specific rule for sulfur, but we do have a specific rule for oxygen. And uh, I will point out in this case that the, uh, the structure of this is the sulfur with the three oxygens coming off of the sulfur. So we have no oxygen-oxygen bonds in this molecule. And as a general rule, when you see oxygen, unless I tell you that it is a peroxide, assume that it's not a peroxide. Assume that uh, none of the oxygens are bonded to each other. So in this case, each oxygen atom has a negative two charge, which means that the sulfur has to have a plus six charge so that the overall charge on the molecule is zero. Okay, uh, I'm going to give you some time now to look at the rest of these and start working your way through them. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a minute uh, to work on these and we will start going through them. Okay, so I'm gonna put up the uh, answers now. <clears throat> and so check your work and I'll give you a minute to check your work and then type into the chat if any of them are confusing and you'd like me to go through those. So I'll, I'll give you <clears throat> uh, some time to do the comparison and type in a question if anybody has one. Uh, go over the HNO3 one. You got that one wrong. Okay, sure. So uh, everything's a non-metal. So the hydrogen is going to be a plus one. The oxygens are each minus two. So we have minus six. The plus one plus uh, with a minus six gives us a minus five that's left. So for the whole thing to be neutral, the nitrogen has to be a plus five. Does that clear it up? Great. Okay, uh, all right, let's move on. Now, we use oxidation numbers in the context of a reaction 
to determine if a reaction is a redox reaction or not, and to determine what it is that is being oxidized and what is being reduced if it is. So uh, I'm gonna give you a minute to go through these two reactions, and I want you to assign oxidation numbers to every atom in each of the two reactions. Okay, so here are the oxidation numbers for the first reaction. Check your work. Um, and then if you had trouble with any of those oxidation numbers, uh, let me know in the chat and we can go over it. And secondly, look at this reaction and tell me, do, is this a redox reaction? Does, which means, do any of the oxidation numbers change from the left-hand side to the right-hand side? Riley says nothing changes, and that is exactly correct. So this is not a redox reaction. Check your work on the oxidation numbers for the bottom one. If you had trouble with any of these, let me know in the chat and we can go over it. And then as before, tell me, is this a redox reaction? So do any of the oxidation numbers change from the left-hand side to the right-hand side? Yes. So what, uh, what is it that is losing electrons? Which atom, which atom type, which element is losing electrons? So if you lose electrons, then you become more positive. So the uh, so it, this has to uh, be the oxygen atoms that are going from a negative two state to a zero state. But notice that some of the oxygen atoms are not because there are some oxygens on the right hand side that are still at a negative two. So some of the oxygens are changing oxidation states. Some of them are not. So uh, but they are losing electrons. That's LEO for LEO, loses electrons oxidation. The oxygens are being oxidized. The nitrogens are gaining electrons, so they are being reduced. Okay. Okay, now, one of the uh, biggest problems with, with redox reactions is that they tend to have a lot of components in them. And you t very frequently will have cases like we just saw where you have sort of splitting of, of the elements. So we've got nitrogen on the left uh, in one place, but it's in two different places on the right. We've got oxygen in one place on the left, but in three different places on the right. And so balancing this equation 
balancing this, this redox reaction equation is actually quite difficult. So what we have to do is bring in some new techniques to, uh, to, in order to balance redox reactions. And we're gonna go through two different approaches for doing that. So the first thing we're going to do is assign oxidation numbers. So another uh, point of practice here, I'll give you about 30 seconds on this one. Uh, write down the reaction and assign the oxidation numbers. Okay, so here are the oxidation numbers. Make sure that uh, you are able to determine those uh, correctly. Our next step is to identify what is oxidized and what is reduced. And I really like, and remember, remembering Leo goes Gur, I really like this sort of arrow notation that I use showing that the copper here is being oxidized and that the nitrogen here is being reduced. You then need to identify the number of electrons that are being transferred as written. So notice here that the copper is going from a zero state to a plus two state. So it is losing two electrons. The nitrogen is going from a plus five to a plus four state. So it is gaining one electron. So minus two electrons plus one electron. Now, in order for this to be balanced in terms of electrons, that means that this reaction here, the nitrogen going from plus five to plus four, has to happen twice as many times as the copper going from zero to plus two. So we multiply to equal the electron transfers and we have to multiply this portion by two. So the way we do that is that we put twos in front of each of those. Now, at this point, we start to identify what components are fixed. So if we start with one, uh, uh, one unit of, of copper, the only place copper appears on the right-hand side is the copper nitrate, which says that that has to be fixed as well, okay? Now, but we have, uh, and we also know that the NO2 has to be fixed because all of the reduced nitrogen ends up here. So, th so that too, it has to be fixed. Now we say that the, the nitrogens that are over here go to two different places. So we have two nitrogens from this, we have two nitrogens from this, so we need to have a total of four nitrogens over on this side. The only thing that is now not, not fixed is the H2O. So we look at this and we see we have four hydrogens. So we're probably gonna need a two there. And to double check, we have 12 oxygens on the left-hand side. We so far have three times two is six, plus four is 10. We need two more oxygens on the right. So both from hydrogen and oxygen, we need to have two waters. And so now we have the, uh, uh, the balanced equation. Can you explain how to find the oxidation number of copper nitrate? Yes. So uh, the first thing you have to know in this case is that the nitrate ion is one of the common ions that, uh, uh, that you learned back in Chem 111. And so the nitrate ion has a negative one charge. So within one single nitrate ion, you have, uh, have uh, oxygens being ne negative two. So a total of negative six. The overall nitrate ion is negative one, so that means the nitrogen has to be a plus five. Now, so we have two of the nitrates for a minus, uh, minus two total, meaning the copper has to be a plus two, so the whole thing is going to be neutral. All right, so this is one way to go through and balance um, redox reactions. Let's go through another example here. We have lead sulfide, plus oxygen leads to lead oxide plus uh, sulfur dioxide. So 
first thing to do is to assign oxidation numbers. Now you're going to run into an issue with this one because the lead sulfide is a little bit complicated because none of our rules work for that. So we do the best we can. The best we can is to look at a periodic table and notice that sulfur is in the same group as oxygen. And so if oxygen usually has a negative two oxidation number, sulfur probably does too. So we assign our oxidation numbers. We identify what is, uh, uh, what is losing electrons, what is gaining electrons, and all of the oxygens that are uh, going across here are gaining two electrons, and there are three of them, so we have a total of six electrons being gained for three oxygen atoms. But we need three halves in front so that we have the same number of oxidation, uh, uh, excuse me, oxygen atoms on both sides. And so we have this as our uh, balanced reaction if we multiply through to get rid of the fractional coefficients. All right. Let's look at, a more, uh, at another example here. So assign oxidation numbers. I'll give you 30 seconds to do that. Okay, so all of these should be, uh, should be quick, except for the very first one, the K2Cr207. So HI, you should immediately write down plus one minus one. KI, you should immediately write down plus one minus one. CRI3, well, each I is a minus one, which means the CR has to be a plus three. I2, that's an element, zero. H2O, plus one minus two. Those should go down, at, uh, you should be able to write those down as quickly as I just uh, rattled them off. Now, the K2Cr207, that's the, that one has more going on in it. The first thing that should jump out at you is the oxygens. You write the minus two over that. So you, uh, the next thing you notice is the K2, uh, that's in group one. Uh, so you know those are plus ones. So the O's are going to have a total of minus 14. You have two pluses, um, uh, so you have a minus 12 left to account for, split across two chromiums, so each one is going to be a plus six. Okay, all right, so this is a skill that it is worth practicing with a bunch of, of examples. Okay, once we have that done, we identify what is oxidized, what is reduced. Okay, so looking at left-hand side to right-hand side, we can see that the iodine uh, is going from a minus one to a zero, but there's a bunch of other iodines here that are not changing. And we see the chromium is going from a plus six to a plus three. So those are the two that are changing. So we have the reduction, we have the oxidation. Uh, we identify that the I2 on the right-hand side has two uh, uh, iodines, so we need to have a two in front of the HI so that we have the same number of atoms involved. And the same thing for the chromiums. We've got two chromiums on the left, so we need to have two chromiums on the right. Now we can start identifying the number of electrons that are being transferred. So a total of six electrons, three each for the two chromiums, and a total of two electrons for the two iodines that we're looking at meaning we now need to multiply the oxidation step by three so that it's six electrons uh, in each case. So now we're at this point of having the, the electrons balanced. Now that we have the electrons balanced, we see what do we know is fixed? Well, we know that this is fixed because all of the chromiums get reduced uh, to form this. And so this has to be fixed as well, because that's the only place the chromiums are going. Uh, on the iodine side, we also know that these are fixed, because uh, the only iodines that show up here are the ones that are oxidized. 
now we can start looking at the other components. So we know that if this is fixed, I'm going to back this up a step. If, th if this is fixed, all of the potassiums go here, so we have to have two of these. Next up, we can look at the oxygens. So we notice that we have seven oxygens on the left-hand side, and those are fixed, meaning that we have to have seven water molecules. The only thing that's not fixed is the HI. So let's uh, first look at the hydrogens. If we have seven of these, then we have 14 uh, HIs on the left-hand side. And if we do that, does that work for the number of iodides? So 14 iodides, we have two, we have six for a total of eight, plus uh, six more for a total of 14, and it works. So that is one procedure that we can use to balance redox reactions. And so our final uh, uh, equation looks like this. There's another method known as the half reaction method. And this is going to be what you want to use in a case where you're not given all of the reagents to begin, all of the reactants or products to begin with. So for example, going back to this case, you are given everything that you're dealing with, including the waters. But sometimes you're told, well, the chromium is going to, uh, to, to become chromium three plus and the iron's gonna do this. It's happening in aqueous solution. So there are probably some waters involved too, maybe some acids, uh, maybe some other things. So, but we have uh, extra stuff that's going to have to get added in. And for this, we use what's known as the half reaction method. And the half reactions are the oxidation reaction and the reduction reaction where we're uh, including the electrons. So this procedure has a series of steps we follow as well. First step is to write the two half reactions. So the iron is going from iron two plus to iron three plus. The dichromate is going to the chromium three plus. The next thing we do is that we balance everything except the oxygens and the hydrogens. So in this case, we need to balance the chromiums because there are two chromiums on the left, we need to have two chromiums on the right. The next step is to balance the oxygens and we do that by adding waters. So we have seven oxygens on the left, we need to have seven waters on the right. We now balance the hydrogens by adding H pluses. So if we have seven waters on the right, that's 14 hydrogens, so we need 14 H pluses on the left. The next step is to balance the charges by adding electrons. So the iron, we finally do something with the, uh, uh, with the first half reaction. We have to balance that by adding an electron on the right so that it's a plus two total charge on both sides. For the bottom reaction, we need six electrons on the, on the left so that we have a total plus three on both sides. Okay. The next thing we do, kind of what, like what we did on the earlier version, is we balance the electrons across the reactions. So if we have six electrons here and one electron here, we need to multiply the top reaction by six so that we have the same number of electrons being transferred in both half reactions. Finally, we add the two reactions together and cancel anything that's on both sides. So in this case, the only thing that's on both sides are the electrons, so they get canceled out, and we're left with our balanced chemical reaction. This is the half reaction method. And in this case, we ended up saying, well, it's having an aqueous solution under acidic conditions, so, uh, so we have the balanced reaction. But maybe you're told this is happening under basic conditions, which means that instead of having H pluses, we need to have uh, OH minuses. And so we have an extra step if it's under basic conditions. And we add hydroxides to both sides of the equations to cancel out all of the H pluses. So we would need to add a total of 14 hydroxides to both sides. The H pluses combine with the OH minuses to make H2Os. And then if we have 14 H2Os on the left, seven H2Os on the right, seven of them cancel out, leaving seven H2Os behind on the left and we now have 14 OH minuses on the right. So this is the same redox reaction, but down here, it's under acidic conditions. Up here, it's under basic conditions. So you can carry out many oxidation redox reactions under either acidic or basic conditions, and uh, this is how you convert from one to the other. This is another 
uh, slide that you might want to do a screenshot of so that you have, have this one available for later. I'll give you a moment to do that in case you need to. All right. And usually in these cases, it's a good idea to take a step back and make sure that everything's balanced. Iron uh, atoms, iron atoms, chromium atoms, chromium atoms, oxygen atoms, and, and keep uh, on going there because there's so much going on in these reactions that it's easy to miss something. Okay, that is redox reactions. We're now going to talk for a little bit about electrochemistry. And the idea of electrochemistry is that these half reactions we've been talking about, they still have to ha both happen in order for the reaction to proceed but we separate where they're happening in space so that we have oxidation happening in one beaker and we have reduction happening in the other beaker. Oops, I didn't mean to hit uh, click that. And they are connected in two ways. They are connected by a wire, which can run through a circuit, and that is where the electrons are flowing. So as oxidation happens producing electrons, those electrons flow along the wire and they, uh, they come to, the, uh, to this side and they then cause the reduction to happen over here. If that is happening, if electrons are flowing from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, then we're gonna have a negative charge building up on the right-hand side and a positive charge building up on the left-hand side. Which, and that means that the electrons that are coming will get repelled and they won't end up going, going in, right? But, if we put what's called a salt bridge between them, so we have potassium chloride in here, so that we have potassium ions and chloride ions floating around. If this is building up a negative charge, then the potassium ions are gonna be attracted this way and are gonna flow into the solution neutralizing the charge. And the chlorine ions that are going, chloride ions that are going this way are gonna be attracted to the positive charge we have here. And so it's gonna equalize the charge on this side. And so this salt bridge completes the circuit. And so charge, uh, negative charge flows this way uh, along the wire, negative charge flows this way across the salt bridge. And so the both sides remain neutral. This is electricity. This is, uh, this is how a battery works. A battery is simply two separated half reactions for oxidation and reduction. That's what's going on in it. So uh, let's look at what's happening in the anode first, the oxidation. We'll explain why it's called an anode in a minute. Oxidation is happening here. Zinc solid, which is the electrode, the metal rod that is sticking into the solution, is turning into zinc ions that are dissolved into the liquid. And so if this reaction continues for an extended period of time, then uh, the electrode is going to be etched away, at, eaten away, uh, and the concentration of the zinc in the solution is going to be going up significantly, the zinc uh, two plus ions. Over here on the cathode where the reduction is happening, uh, we have the copper two plus that is in solution that is then joining with electrons that are coming along the wire and depositing as new copper onto the surface of the copper electrode that is in the solution. And so we are going to end up with the copper electrode growing over the course of the reaction as this uh, reaction proceeds. Um, so let's also now think about the potassium and the chloride that are uh, migrating along the salt bridge. Now remember our terminology for charges of ions, anions and cations. Anions are the negative ions and the negative ions are traveling toward the anode. So that's one way to remember which side is the anode is that the anions in the salt bridge are flowing toward it. The cations, the positive ions, the potassium in this case, are flowing toward the cathode. So uh, ca uh, cations toward the cathode along the salt bridge. Okay, uh, some terminology that we, uh, uh, that we are using. So we have electric charge, which is measured in units of coulombs. And so the, and it's the magnitude of the charge is the charge on a proton. So uh, uh, that's so a 
uh, a charge on a proton has this much charge in coulombs. The charge on an electron is simply the negative of this. Um, the movement of charge is a current, which is measured in amperes, which is the same as coulombs per second. So uh, however many electrons per second are transferring across the, uh, uh, along the wire, tells us the current that, uh, that we are getting. The electric potential measures the force with which the electrons are moving, and that is measured in joules per coulomb. Um, and uh, I'm not, we aren't really going to talk about electric field too much in this particular unit, but, that, uh, uh, but that's uh, included here as well. Okay, there are several different types of electrochemical cells that we, uh, we're going to be talking about. I'm going to briefly go through these types now on this slide. Uh, and then we are going to, in detail, go through get some galvanic cells so that we can learn some more concepts about electrochemistry. Um, but, we, uh, but basically, from batteries on down, we will go into in more detail uh, in the Wednesday slash Thursday class at the beginning of class period. So galvanic cells is what I've described so far. Galvanic cells are uh, what happens when you have a spontaneous redox reaction that's happening, where you have separated the reduction half cell from the oxidation half cell. This produces electrical energy, and uh, this process is what is used in batteries, and it is also the process that is responsible for corrosion of uh, of metals uh, in environmental situations. So rust is formed because of a galvanic re oxidation reduction process. A concentration cell is a particular type of galvanic cell where the half reaction that's happening for oxidation is the same as the ox uh, a half reaction that's happening for reduction, just in reverse. The difference between the two is that the concentrations in the two half cells are different. And so because of that concentration difference, you can end up with the redox reaction happening in a way that favors one side over the other. And so the <coughs> you end up getting a voltage across the, uh, the current across the uh, across the uh, the cell a fuel cell is a type of galvanic cell where you are introducing a fuel and you are pulling out uh, waste products so as we discussed earlier the concentration of the ions in the uh, in the galvanic cell we were describing is going to be changing as the reaction proceeds so if you imagine uh, uh, having some sort of kind of flow system so that you are refreshing these, the solutions that you're dealing with over the course of the reaction, providing more ions as fuel or removing ions as waste as it's going, that's the concept of a fuel cell. Uh, although usually that is not an ionic system that's working, it's usually something like um, methanol or, uh, or hydrogen gas or something that is being oxidized by oxygen, and it's kind of being burned. Uh, it's kind of like a combustion reaction, but instead of it being truly burned, what's happening is it's the same overall reaction, but uh, you're creating electricity over the process. Uh, so we'll go into that in more detail later. And finally, we have electrolytic cells. Uh, and the process that's happening in an electrolytic cell is called electrolysis. And the idea of an electrolytic uh, cell, if I can get the words out, the, uh, the idea of an electrolytic cell is that you have something that uh, going one direction would be a galvanic cell, but you apply a voltage forcing the, uh, the reaction go to go the other direction. So you're putting maybe a battery in between uh, uh, where uh, the voltmeter was, that's of the opposite polarity, and what it ends up doing is forcing the reaction to go back the other direction. So, um, uh, so you're taking the non-spontaneous process and you're making it up uh, uh, spontaneous by applying this external electric current to it. This is what is happening when you recharge a battery. Um, uh, it is used. Uh, commercially for generating elements or compounds quite uh, in many cases. So uh, getting sodium metal from sodium chloride, for example, or getting chloride gas from sodium chloride, or splitting water into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. Those are electrolytic cells that are happening. It's also the process that is used in electroplating. So if you take a um, 
if you take a piece of silverware and then you put it in a solution of silver chloride and you then uh, pass a current uh, th through the system, you can plate silver onto the uh, surface of uh, the metal spoon that you're looking at. So silver plating happens by that method. So that's sort of the, the range of types of electrochemical cells that are possible. We're going to explore a few more concepts. Is, uh, so Shane asked, is cell synonymous with system? So a cell is specifically an electrochemical system that is happening, that which you can divide into a, an oxidation half cell and a reduction half cell. So a, a, uh, a cell uh, is specific to electrochemical uh, systems. So now we're going to go into galvanic cells a little bit to illustrate some more concepts, um, but we won't get to really sort of the cataloging of the different types until we get to um, uh, Wednesdays and Thursdays. So this is a galvanic cell, um, similar to the one that we've already looked at. So we have our uh, anode side and our cathode side. We have our salt bridge. In this case, we have a copper two uh, solution, copper nitrate and a copper anode. We have a silver cathode in a silver nitrate solution. Our salt bridge in this case is sodium nitrate. <coughs> As before, we have electrons flowing from the anode to the cathode. Um, the anides, excuse me, I can't talk. The anions flow toward the anode in the, uh, in the salt bridge. The cat cations flow toward the cathode in the salt bridge. Um, there is an abbreviated notation that we use called cell notation here that, uh, that, that tells you all the information you need to generate this picture. So we have on the left-hand side, we have copper that uh, we put the electrodes on the outside. The vertical bar is a phase boundary. And so we have a phase boundary between the solid copper and the copper two solution that we have. Um, and we specify the concentration of the solution in here. On the right hand side, we have the silver solution with a phase boundary to the silver solid. In between, we use a double vertical line to be, mean the salt bridge. And so this is enough information to be able to draw this picture that we have. And so we have the anode half reaction and the cathode half reaction. Um, we, the convention is always to put the anode on the left and the cathode on the right. You can remember that by, the, uh, by the, it being alphabetical. Uh, anode comes before cathode. And it, it's convention as well in, the, in these pictures to put the anode on the left and the cathode on the right. The voltage that we observe, in this case 0.46 volts, is a function of the two individual half reactions. And we'll go into in a moment how, those, uh, how we use that uh, later. Um, but it should make sense that, um, uh, that we can treat the two half reactions independently, because if we sort of draw a, a, a plane down here, we can't tell on the left-hand side what's going on in the beaker on the right-hand side, except by how much it's pulling the electrons uh, through here and by how much it's shoving the, uh, uh, the salt bridge across, uh, across here. So we should be able to treat the left-hand side and the right-hand side as independent boxes, essentially, that are connected just by the wire and by the salt bridge. So um, what we have here now is another type of electrode that's going to be important. So on the right-hand side is the kind of thing that we've talked about before, where we have a magnesium electrode and we have some kind of equilibrium that's going on with the magnesium two plus ions. And so the magnesium electrode is going to either grow or shrink based on whether it's oxidation or reduction that's happening over here. But on the left-hand side here, we have hydrogen gas and we have H plus, and those are the things that are in equilibrium. So, uh, uh, so we have an, an inert electrode which simply serves as the surface upon which the gas and the aqueous ions are interfacing with each other. And so um, uh, very often that is going to be a platinum, uh, a piece of platinum that's in there, or another common one that's used would be a graphite rod is, is very frequently used. Now I mentioned, uh, so that is called an inert electrode. This is called an active electrode. Now I, I say here, what's wrong with this picture? Can anybody identify what is incorrect 
about what's going on uh, in the picture. And I put this up here because I was looking for a picture of an inert electrode. I found this, I put it into the presentation and I realized after I put it in, huh, it's wrong. And uh, this is a good sort of object lesson of go find something on the internet, don't always trust it. What's wrong is that it's wrong, uh, it's wrong back to left, uh, right to left. So if we look at the cell notation of what's going on here, the, uh, and if we look at the reactions that are happening up here, we have oxidation happening at the magnesium electrode. That means that's the anode, so we should have the anode on the left. Okay. So <clears throat> I said that we need to be able to, uh, we should be able to treat each half cell as independent, even though it is not possible to have a half cell happening independent of the other half cell. But, but an implication of that is that we can only measure a voltage relative to some other half cell that we have present. And so we need a convention. And the convention that is typically used is what's known as a standard hydrogen electrode. Standard hydrogen electrode has the platinum uh, wire that, or platinum plate that is immersed into the system. We have hydrogen gas and we have an aqueous solution of acid. And it is a standard electrode under standard conditions, which means we have one atmosphere of the hydrogen gas and we have one molar hydrochloric acid that we're dealing with. And we define the voltage of this half cell to be zero. Then, when we hook up our standard hydrogen electrode to another half cell with a voltmeter and with a salt bridge, then whatever voltage we measure is going to be our half cell voltage for the other half electrode, uh, half cell, because we have defined this one to be zero. So uh, in this case, and uh, I mentioned here standard conditions designated by this little degree sign, means that uh, all gases that are involved are at one atmosphere pressure and all concentrations that are involved are at one molar. And so we have the reduction happening at the cathode. And so our, our cell potential, which is the value that we measure on the voltmeter, is the cathode half cell potential minus the anode half cell potential. And we defined the anode half cell potential for this case, because it's a standard hydrogen electrode, to be zero. So the voltage that we measure is the cathode half, uh, half cell potential. And so experimentally, we find that the copper two plus copper uh, react, uh, uh, half cell reaction has a reduction potential, a standard reduction potential of 0 0.37, 337 volts. And so we can come up with a table of, uh, of all sorts of different reduction reactions. Now, at some point, we're going to end up, uh, so all of these are reductions. At some points, we're gonna end up with negative half cell reactions, uh, half cell voltages, which means that the reverse reaction is the one that's actually gonna be happening, and that's the oxidation. So by convention, what we, uh, tabulate are the reduction potentials, but if you need the reverse reaction, which is the oxidation process, then you change the sign of the voltage uh, that is listed right here. And so, uh, so uh, that is why we take the cathode voltage minus the anode voltage, because what we're looking at for the anode voltage is the reduction potential, but really what we're doing is adding the oxidation potential, which, uh, because that's the, the one that's happening in, in this process. Okay, now, so we have a bunch of equations that we can look at here. So the charge on a mole of electrons is Faraday's constant, okay? And so this is just a constant like Planck's constant, Boltzmann's constant, things like this, you just look it up. And it has this value in terms of coulombs per mole. Now, the electrical work that is done is the voltage times the charge that is uh, transferred. Um, and we can find, and the voltage is our E cell. This should be a subscript. I, I forgot to put that as a subscript. And the charge is going to be the number of moles of electrons times Faraday's constant. 
and the negative is just for the uh, the convention of the work because the work is the work done by the system, and so it's it's going uh, it's going down. And so with this, we can now go uh, compare to our Gibbs free energy, which you may remember me mentioning in class that the Gibbs free energy. What we mean by free energy is that it's the energy that is free to do work. It's the amount of work that you can do when the reaction happens. So our Gibbs free energy equals our electrical work. Well, we know that that's this thing. So we can compare the uh, voltage on the cell and convert that to the Gibbs free energy for the reaction that's happening. Now, if we um, uh, make this uh, under standard conditions, then the Gibbs free energy is compared to the uh, the free energy, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, standard cell voltage rather than the actual cell voltage under non-standard conditions. And we also uh, should remember from last week's material that the standard Gibbs free energy has a relationship with the equilibrium constant. So this now gives us a way to compare, uh, to, to relate the standard cell potential to the, or standard cell voltage to the equilibrium constant. So we have this set of relationships among the equilibrium constant, the gi standard Gibbs free energy for the reaction, and the standard cell potential. And we have these relations. Now, this triangle is in the textbook, so don't worry about scribbling it down all that quickly. Um, uh, but uh, these three components, the, the equilibrium constant, the standard Gibbs free energy, and the standard cell potential are all essentially measuring the same thing in three different ways is what's going on. The one thing I need to specify here is N, the number of moles of electrons in the balanced redox reaction. So when you write the reaction down, and when you do it using like the half cell method, or where I did those sort of kind of squared off arrows, and we wrote how many electrons are being transferred, and then we had to multiply up so that the same number of electrons uh, are being oxidized as being reduced. Well, uh, that number of electrons is what N is in this case. That, and in all of these uh, equations, that's what N is used for. Okay, now, Gibbs free energy is maximum, uh, all this is right here is me taking what was down here and I slid it up. So we have the relationship between Gibbs free energy and the, and the cell potential, uh, standard cell potential and the uh, standard cell potential, standard Gibbs free energy and the equilibrium constant. Now, remember that with Gibbs free energy, we were able to determine the, uh, uh, the Gibbs free energy under non-standard conditions using this expression right here, where we have the reaction quotient. Well, we now know what this is for a redox reaction. We can just plug it in. We know what this is for a redox reaction. It's just the same expression, but with under standard conditions. And so now we have this expression, which we can then divide through by negative NF, to get what is known as the Nernst equation. And the Nernst equation lets us take a standard cell potential, which re remember, that means that the gases are at one atmosphere and the all concentrations are at one molar, and convert it to whatever conditions we want and find out what the, the voltage is going to be under, the, uh, under those conditions. Okay. And that is it for the new material for today. I know that was a lot. There was a fire hose of information there. Um, what we're going to be doing on Wednesday and Thursday at the beginning of class is applying those concepts to a bunch of examples, dry cell batteries, alkaline batteries, uh, NICAD batteries, concentration cells, fuel cells, corrosion and electrolysis and stuff. All of that is going to build on this, the material that we just went over. So, um, uh, we have like one minute of class left, um, though if anybody had, uh, I'm happy to stay after. Does anybody have any questions related to this material? I'm going to stop sharing screen and I'm going to turn on the ability for people to unmute themselves if anybody has a question you'd like to ask. Ah, and Emily just said she's sending out practice worksheet today. Excellent. 
All right, can I go back to the copper silver cell? All the parts are positive except the nitrate. Uh, okay, let's, I'll share screens back again. Uh, so I'm gonna come over here. Copper, silver, uh, not that one. So this one, okay, let's see here. Uh, so there are, um, yes, the, uh, everything is positive except for the electrons and except for the nitrate ions. And that's because we made our silver plus solution from silver nitrate. We made our copper, um, uh, uh, two plus solution with copper nitrate, and we made our salt bridge with sodium nitrate. So uh, uh, in a, uh, we will often do that so that there's only one type of counter ion that we're dealing with. And the nitrate you notice doesn't actually participate in any of the electron transfer processes that are happening. It's just a spectator ion through all of this. So did that address your confusion or concern about that one? And is there anything else I can clear up for anybody? So if you look at the cell notation that's over here, this tells you what the processes are that are going on. The copper is giving up two electrons to make copper two plus. The silver plus is accepting ele uh, electrons to make silver. And so there's no, there are no negative ions involved in what's happening. It's just the positive ions where electrons are getting exchanged. And it's, it's taking something that's neutral and making positive ions, it's taking something that's positive and making neutral ions. So the, the nitrates are basically just um, uh, floating around, uh, being the counter ions so that you don't have these highly charged things that you're dealing with. That, that's all the nitrates doing. All right, well, we are over time. So um, uh, no more new material, you're welcome. Uh, if, if there's still some lingering confusions, I am happy to stick around and try to address them. Uh, if there aren't, um, we're done for today. Copper CUS bar Cu2 plus tells us it's losing two electrons. The Ag plus bar Ag is gaining the electron. Yes, and so what that means is that the uh, what's happening over at the cathode is going to be happening twice as fast in terms of atoms as what's happening over at the anode. So it, it will have to have two um, silvers uh, getting uh, uh, getting reduced for every copper that is being oxidized. So the CuNO3 is growing in concentration. That's correct. Um, uh, it, minor correction, uh, that would have NO3 in parentheses with a two around it because each nitrate is a minus one. Um, and, and so the copper is growing in concentration because copper is coming off of the anode. The NO3 is growing in concentration because the salt bridge is, is sending more NO3 in. Um, and in the silver case, it is uh, becoming less concentrated because the silver is leaving uh, uh, onto the cathode and the nitrate is leaving, uh, going up the salt bridge.
oh no, I don't think you left. I would, uh, I, I, I will stay here until you either leave or uh, you, uh, you say that you're done. Oh, I, and I guess you're home, not in the classroom. So you right. can do this talk. <laughs> yes, that's true. Cat is gaining and is losing. I still struggle even after a year of chemistry, cation and cation and anion as to which one's positive and which one's negative. So the, uh, uh, I don't know if this is a common um, mnemonic to remember it, but uh, I remember it as negative anion is Na, which is sodium. And then PC, positive cation, PC is like uh, politically correct. So th those are the two things that come into my head. So I, I, I don't know if that helps anybody else. It's kind of weird, but that's how I remember it when I can't remember it. <laughs> well, and then it's kind of reduced they're reversed in what they're doing in electrolysis because the cations gaining electrons, so it's actually reducing charge. Well, okay, so there's a difference between cation and cathode, right? And anion and anode. So uh, the anode is ne uh, is negatively charged. Um, no, no, no. Uh, the the anode is <laughs> right. They're basically reversal of your mnemonic. Right. So the anions move toward the anode. Um, cations move toward the cathode. So moving towards the mnemonic. What did you say, Na? Um, uh, negative anion. Uh, and I, I remember that because Na for a chemist is sodium, and so, uh, uh, and and so I, I know to associate negative with anion because of Na. Um, but there's got to be a better anymore. better way to do that. Because yeah. yeah. sodium is actually positive. It's a Anion. Yes, that's true. But but if I think anion, do I associate negative or positive with it? Well, PA isn't a thing in, that I'm remembering. NA is so negative anion. Right. The, the PC makes for, makes it easy enough to kind of think the other right. way. The, the other one's the other one, right? <laughs> I know one half. I know the other half. Right. Um, okay. Just a lot. I gotta get back to catching up on spontaneity and gives free energy and stuff. So <laughs> once I get caught up there, I think the latter half of that's gonna make a little more sense. But. Almost certainly, yes. Well, thank you for the time and answering the questions, and uh, we'll see you Wednesday. All right. Have a have a good rest of your day.